Welcome to The Homeless Conservative, a show about principled politics for exhausted citizens. I am Blake Fisher, and I'm a political junkie so that you don't have to be, although I totally welcome you if you're a political junkie too. I know you've got a lot of things competing for your attention, so let's get to what mattered this week. And this week, what I think mattered is the Biden administration's new electric vehicle plans. So the Biden administration announced new electric vehicle plan aims to have 31 to 44 percent of new light duty vehicles, which would be like cars, SUVs, pickup trucks, you know, the normal consumer kind of vehicles to be fully electric by 2030. So that's uh, a quarter or sorry, like a third to almost half of all new sales of vehicles to be fully electric by 2030. That's actually scaled back a little bit from what their initial goals were, but they kind of dialed it back a little bit based on, I think, Ford and some other companies being like, hey, it seems a little unrealistic. Um, And just so that you know, EV sales were 9.1% of light duty vehicles in 2023, which was up from 6.8% in 2022. However, that percentage decreased from 22 to 23 because people are kind of jumping from electric vehicles to hybrids right now. But just some for, you know, the perspective of if EV sales were 9% of the sales in 2023, he wants to get to 31 to 44%. And this is all complicated math based on how many vehicles you sell and the miles per gallon of the other vehicles you sell. And um, that's a pretty big jump in just a few years. And we're, we're five or six years away from 2030. So this is part of their broader effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote the adoption of clean energy technologies, of course. And... I, my question is, will it work? Is there that much of a consumer demand for electric vehicles right now? So 2023, like I said, saw that slowdown of EV purchases, and some car companies are pivoting to more manufacturing of those popular hybrid vehicles instead. And do we even have the infrastructure to support that many vehicles being fully electric? So surprise, this is a complicated situation with a lot of different moving points and things. And so let's talk about some of those things and if we think we can actually get there. So the first thing we got to talk about is the cars. Obviously, the common narrative is that EVs are way more efficient than internal combustion engines. Obviously, it's not just about the tailpipe emissions. So like the carbon that like a internal combustion engine is going to put out into the air versus an electric vehicle. They're also just talking about the efficiency because when you put gas in an ICE or internal combustion engine, I'll use ICE interchangeably with EV and for electric vehicles throughout this thing, I'm sure. So, you know, the, the stat is that 40% of that energy is used and 60% of it is wasted. It's turned into heat or friction or something when you use an internal combustion engine, whereas an EV uses 90% efficiency of the battery. So the immediate claim is just people go, oh, electric vehicles are more efficient. They're better for the environment. End of story. Not exactly. So they're claiming EVs are three times more energy efficient based on that 90% to 40% you know, efficiency rule. But that's not all that you have to account for when you're talking about efficiency. I think you also need to talk about the cost of building that battery for the electric vehicle and how are we powering, how are we charging that battery? Like what is the energy source to charge that battery? And often the source of that electricity is much less efficient than gas power. So you got to think of it this way. Like each vehicle type is going to have an engine of some sort and a fuel source of some sort. And the fuel source absolutely matters because some are more energy efficient than others. So we're not just talking about electric vehicle first in first ICE, you know, internal combustion engine, we're talking about what is the fuel. So the fuel for ICE is obviously gasoline, right? We know what that one is, but for an electric vehicle, it could be coal that creates the electricity. It could be natural gas. It could be solar. It could be wind. It could be hydroelectric. It could be lots of different things, right? And those energy sources really matter when we're talking about the efficiency of the vehicle and how far it can travel per kilowatt hour. And this gets kind of confusing because when we talk about electric vehicles versus gas vehicles, we're used to the mile per gallon measurement for gas vehicles, but we don't have that kind of thing for electric vehicles. But we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And so the important thing on any of those energy sources that go into an electric vehicle is something that different people call different stuff. Some people call it energy density. Some people call it energy return on investment or EROI, or even energy return on energy invested, EROEI. A-E-I-O-U. I mean, we're kind of... <laughs> uh, anyway, the, the point is, there's different ways to talk about it. But the point, what they're talking about when they see, when you hear energy density or EROI, is there every 
piece of energy takes some energy to make. So to get oil out of the ground, we've got to build a well and we've got to pump that oil out of the ground and then we've got to refine it and we've got to turn it into gasoline. Or for natural gas, we've got to, you know, pull it up out of the ground. We've got to have a well. We've got to then transport that. We've got to sometimes uh, process it some for like liquefied natural gas, for example, to ship it or something. So there's an energy cost and then there's how much energy do, do we then get out of that energy source? And so wood-fired stove, as an example, just to talk about since this was something that was commonly used for all of human history until we had things like steam and coal and gasoline and et cetera. So I'd have to have a tree. I'd have to grow a tree potentially or have a tree there. I'd have to cut it down. I'd have to then chop the firewood. I'd have to burn that wood to create energy for like steam or for heat or whatever I'm trying to create for energy. And I don't know how we get this number. I read some reports from some specific people and they say that like wood burning has an EROI of five to one, for example. So it takes one unit of energy to do all that stuff I talked about to get five units of energy back of the burning of the wood. And we shouldn't poo-poo on the five to one ratio because that's what we used for like all of human history, like I said, <laughs> until fairly recently, the last few hundred years. So um, just to give you some of those other numbers, oil and natural gas gets about 30 to one on the energy on that ratio. Gasoline's like 45 to 1. I don't totally understand why gasoline is higher than natural gas and oil, since oil is just natural coming out of the gas. I'm guessing the refining process is part of it. Anyway, this is just numbers that I got from someone else. And then uh, solar and wind are like 3.5 to 1. So that's about 10 times less than oil and natural gas, just for the record. And then stuff like, like I said, wood fired stuff would be like 5 to 1. Nuclear energy is 100 to 1. So nuclear energy, by far, in a way, the best when it comes to energy return on investment. It's very little energy put into it. Obviously, a nuclear facility takes a lot of time to build, but then once it's built, it's like you got to mine the uranium, and that's pretty much it as far as your energy intensive. So it's like you put one unit in, you'd get 100 units out. So nuclear, obviously, is a great thing. We should use more of it. Um, about 20% of our grid is nuclear right now. 40% is natural gas, and 20% is coal, and then the rest is the rest of it. So uh, but this this website I'm talking about is gorozen.com, G-R-O-Z-E-N.com, and it's a group of natural resource investors, and I like their research and data because their goal is to make money off natural resource investing. So they invest in things like whatever, coal, natural gas, oil, um, minerals, gold, name it, you know, and they get into a lot of the math and markets and not really the politics of the stuff, which I like because I think that when we're thinking about these things, we do need to think of them as we need to look at the data and we need to look at the actual stuff and not let our politics shape how we think of these energy sources and instead let their efficiency or capabilities influence our politics. It's fine to have goals in politics, but I think too often right now with the left, especially in Democrats, they're only motivated by two things. They're not motivated by climate change. So they think climate change is an existential threat and therefore we got to do everything we can to stop it from to slow climate change or to reduce carbon emissions or reduce carbon in the air so that we could actually cool the planet a little bit. Well, in doing that, they look at everything through that lens. So their goal is 100% electric vehicles. Their goal is 100% renewables. But they're not really looking at the data of like, how do we get there? Is solar, are solar and wind good energy returns on investment? Or would they become too cost prohibitive to potentially use for 100% of our grid. I think it's pretty obvious right now that we could not have a grid entirely based on renewables like solar, wind, and hydroelectric. It just doesn't, like, the technology is not there yet. It might be in 30 years. It's definitely not right now, though. So they only look at everything through climate change and global warming and, and that environmentalist lens, but I don't even think they really look at it through an environmentalist lens because they don't really consider the mining of the minerals to create batteries and that kind of stuff. They're really only looking at the tailpipe emissions of the EV versus the inc the internal combustion engine. And I think you need to dig a little deeper into the data. And this GoRosen.com did specifically do that because the problem that they saw is that when we're talking about the difference between electric vehicles and internal combustion engines, we're not using the same measurements to talk about their efficiencies. So with internal combustion engines, we're talking about 
miles per gallon. That's been the standard that we've been using in, in America, at least, because we use miles, not kilometers. But in the EU and stuff, it would be kilometers. But uh, here, miles per gallon is kind of the thing. And the, the, the EPA and several other administrations have done... Um, you know, a lot of forcing the car companies to increase those miles per gallon, the efficiency of their internal combustion engines. And while I think that that's okay-ish, I do think we would have just gotten there with consumer demand because obviously as a consumer of gasoline, I would prefer my car get a higher, you know, all things considered and all things being equal – if I could have the same car, so I mean, I've got three kids, I we have a minivan, if I can have a minivan that gets 45 miles per gallon versus one that gets 20 miles per gallon, I'm going to pick the one that gets 45 miles per gallon because gas is something I have to put in my tank every whatever, however, depending on the week, but sometimes multiple times a week, sometimes once a week, whatever. But like my fuel cost on a 40 mile per, hour per gallon vehicle is going to be half as much as one with a 20 mile per gallon efficiency. And so I think consumers would have gotten to where we're at anyway. I mean, I remember being like one of the highlights of the 90 Corolla I bought when I was 16, it was nine years old at that point, was that it got like 35 miles a gallon. And at the time gas was under a dollar. So I was filling up my tank for less than $5 or whatever. That was a huge upside for a like poor teenager, right? That had to work for that money. And, uh, and so you know, I, I think people would make these decisions anyway without the government forcing the car companies to. But that's a totally different discussion. I guess we could have a different time. But either way, GoRosen.com decided miles per gallon and comparing that to then kilowatt hours for electric vehicles, we need to make the math be the same and we need to make the, the designation be the same so that we can actually compare these two things. And what they wanted to find out was, are electric vehicles actually more efficient over the life of the vehicle than ICEs, internal combustion engines. And I don't want to get into all the math. I will put a link to the report in the description so that you can read it if you'd like to read it. It's actually very interesting. But I'm not going to get into all the math here because it's a podcast. I don't expect you to be doing math in your head while you're driving or um, doing laundry or whatever you're doing while you're uh, spending your time with me. I assume you're not just sitting on the couch in the dark listening to my every word. Um, just that would be weird, right? Power to you, I guess, if you do. So they calculate it's actually not even close over the life of a vehicle and that internal combustion engines actually went out on efficiency um, because they did the math. So here's what the math is, uh, the, the basic high level version of it. So they compared a 37 mile per gallon ICE vehicle to an electric vehicle and found that once they account for the energy to produce the batteries, because if you did not know this about electric vehicles, they have a gigantic battery in them. And right now, for the most part, those batteries are coming from China. China's actually mining the materials and the raw minerals, things like zinc and copper and all these things that take to make a battery, lithium. And then they're making the batteries and we're buying those batteries from them. So there's a huge, you're already, if you buy just like, let's say buy a 37 per mile, mile per gallon car or an EV, you're actually like in debt as far as carbon emissions go on the electric vehicle more so than you are on the ICE vehicle because it takes a lot of energy to create that battery. Now, once you have the vehicle, it's more efficient, yes, in the sense that you are getting, a, you've got a more efficient engine and the power source, depending on the power source, is more efficient too and it's not emitting carbon, right? But you've got a long way to go. You've got to have that car for several years before you're actually even based on just the building of that battery. So they actually looked at this and compared not only the efficiency of the engines themselves, but the fuel sources too, and looked at the EROIs, that you know energy return on investments, comparing gasoline to natural gas. And they used only natural gas when they're talking about this. Now, that's not really how this works. Our grid, as I mentioned, is made up of natural gas and coal and solar and wind and all, you know, all nuclear too. So there is no single source of electricity that you're going to have, but for the sake of doing the math, they needed to be like, okay, let's take the most common one. 40% of our grid is powered by natural gas. So we'll pretend and we'll do the math on these electric vehicles based on it being the electricity coming to it is generated via natural gas. And what they found is that the internal combustion engine gets 41 miles per kilowatt hour of thermal energy because all of these things are just turning into thermal energy, right? Whether it's natural gas or gasoline or solar or wind or whatever, electricity or batteries or whatever, they decided we're going to use kilowatt hours 
And we're going to say, how far can you get on one kilowatt hour in each vehicle? And they determined the internal combustion engine, 41 miles per kilowatt hour. The EV got 32 miles. So that's accounting for the creation of the battery, the mining of the materials, and the life of the vehicle too. The life of the vehicle is different because the life of a battery is like about 120,000 miles, whereas they're estimating the life of a internal combustion engine to be 170,000 miles. So there's that factor as well. And by the way, if they don't use natural gas, when they did the math on if the fuel wasn't solely natural gas, but it was some sort of green mix of wind and solar, it reduced it to 13 miles for kilowatt hour. So if you're using wind and solar to power your car, based on the energy return on investment numbers, you're getting 13 miles per kilowatt hour on the vehicle over the course of its life, as opposed to 41 miles per kilowatt hour on the life of the internal combustion engine. Now, there are other factors when we're comparing the two things. There's maintenance costs. There's all sorts of things. But I'm not talking about the cost to consumers as much right now because that's not what the Biden's, that's not what the Biden administration's goal is here or Democrats' goal. Their goal is to reduce carbon emissions. But this math proves that they're not doing so with electric vehicles. It's just not happening right now. And some of that is being seen by obviously consumers can see that this is happening too. And they're choosing things like hybrids, which are using a little bit of both technologies. So, okay. So if the fuel isn't natural gas and it's using solar and wind, and we're going down to 13 miles per kilowatt hour, and that's also in their roadmap, this seems like disaster, right? Cause now you're talking about the car getting way fewer miles per kilowatt hour than you would if it was being powered by natural gas or nuclear. I mean, if it's nuclear, that number goes even higher. So I'm not saying the EVs can't be the solution, but they cannot be the solution in combination with powering the grid on only renewables, which is also in Democrats' plans. So I think they have two plans here they're trying to do, and when they combine the two of them, it's a disaster. If they didn't try to combine the two of them and said, you know what, we're going to go all in on nuclear instead, yeah, you can make EVs work. But you can't make EVs work on the current grid, and you also can't do it based on their sort of utopian future grid that's fully renewable with wind and solar and hydropower. It's just not possible when you do the math. And government agencies know this, too. There are government reports that show, and I'll put another link to, there are two great um, Kite and Key media. If you don't follow them on YouTube, you really should. They do these great informative uh, informative videos about the bigger policy things that we're not really talking about. Uh, I really like their videos, but they have two videos specifically on the power grid and electric vehicles and, and just kind of like some of the misconceptions that are going into that. But anyway, they've got a great video about these power supplies and, and the differences between them and how we need a good mix of those energy sources and that we can't do it all with renewables. It's just not possible. And that there are government agencies that are saying as much. They're like, they're saying, Look, you can't, the push for renewables only is going to result in essentially loss of life is what they're saying. I mean, because like losing electricity, yes, we're a first world country. Electricity is great for lots of things like the lights that are powering my computer and stuff right now. But it's also used for, you know, like to keep ventilators going in hospitals and uh, many other things that are actually like life saving things. And so it can be really dangerous to not have our heat. And air conditioning, for example, you know, people die of heat stroke when the air conditioner stop working or they freeze to death when their heaters stop working. So the grid working is really, really important. And our grid has a lot of problems, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But but basically, the, the Democrats pipe dream of total sustainable, you know, energy and EVs is just kind of that it's a dream. It's not possible. And, you know, we cannot solve for that. And so I, I just think that that's an important thing to bring up. Um, And also, essentially, their goal of using EVs as the future of limiting carbon emissions is a little foolish because right now we can only get those batteries from China, essentially. So China's doing the mining of the minerals. China's creating these batteries. We're then buying them from China. And I think there's a geopolitical problem there, too. I I think that's a little dangerous to be so reliant on a country that's our geopolitical enemy right now and and has different goals for us or different goals than we do for the world and for themselves. And they'd like to see them become the superpower that controls the world instead of us. And uh, I think that's dangerous to deal with. But the really important part of that is that we cannot control China's energy production. And so if the creation of the battery is not clean, which by the way, it is not because China is building two coal-fired power plants per week right now. 
That's what they're doing for their economy. They're not all of their, um, Oh, look at us. We're going to help with global climate change. Too. They're not, they're just, they're building fire coal fired, bleh, coal fired power plants. We are taking them offline. We've been replacing our coal fired power plants with natural gas over the last several decades. And it's reduced our emissions significantly. Um, not because we switched to renewables, but we, we switched to a cleaner natural gas, right? And so these are the kind of things that we've got to be able to solve for, right? And and I don't understand why we can't um, talk more about them because no one's bringing that up a lot of times. We're, they're not bringing up the fact that the batteries are a huge problem because there's a big China question mark there. And we've got to be able to consider that. For EVs to be the solution that Democrats claim they need to be, You've got to solve for every part of the process being clean energy, too. And like I said, China's not doing that because they're using coal. And not to mention, there are other environmental factors than just the carbon emissions. There's the mining part of it as well. You know, that's actually a big part of an environmental concern. And I think we should look into that. We shouldn't just be like, batteries can solve everything. You've got to mine those materials China is using slave labor to do so in, in some instances with the Uyghurs. I think we got to be careful about that. So we can't necessarily solve for that because it's not our country. We can't tell China what to do necessarily. I mean, we can negotiate things that we want them to do, but we can't tell them exactly what to do. But let's talk about the cars and why sometimes the EV is not the solution that Democrats think it's going to be. Because the first thing is that consumers are a little they're kind of pumping the brakes, <laughs> bad metaphor probably, but for electric vehicles, and I think they have some specific concerns that I've read is that one is charger accessibility. We don't have enough charging stations in the United States to, we certainly don't have enough for this 30 to 40% that he's wanting in a, just a few years. We don't even really have enough right now. And that's a problem for consumers. They're like, well, I want to make sure I can charge this thing when I need to. The second thing is vehicle prices. They are currently generally luxury vehicles is most of the electric vehicles. Do you see the most common two? Tesla, Rivian. Those are luxury vehicles for the most part. I know Tesla has the Model 3. That's kind of their entry level one. But it's still like, uh, you know, I think most people would say a, a just like a normal sedan, like your Honda Civic kind of range, you know, in the twenty to $30,000 range, whereas the Tesla sedan is like, the Model 3 is like thirty dollars to $40,000. So it's a jump up. So you're talking about mostly wealthier people purchasing EVs and adopting them currently. And it's because they can afford it, not only because of the tax incentives, but just because of the price point in general, okay? So there's vehicle prices. That's another consideration. And then the other one is vehicle's ability to handle long trips. Most EVs only have a range of, at the top end, like two to 300 miles uh, on a charge. Most of them are less than that. I mean, some of them are like under 100. And so... People want to be able to take a road trip in America. That's kind of a classic thing we like to do here. And so they want to be able to handle long trips. This is probably anecdotal. Most of the people I know, actually, I do not know a single person that only has electric vehicles. Everyone I know has an electric vehicle and a gas-powered vehicle. And that way they can use whichever one fits their purpose at the time. So my brother would be a good example, drives an F-350 diesel, <laughs> not necessarily because he needs to, but it's actually my parents' truck. They use it to pull an RV. Uh, so that's his everyday driver. But his wife, my sister-in-law, has a Jeep 4xe, which has a fully electric engine if she wants to use it. It only has like about a 25-mile range or something. But that'll get her around the city, but it can also switch to gas. It's a hybrid. So you get that peace of mind where you can switch to gasoline, which there's gas stations everywhere. And so you don't have to worry about, can I make it on a long trip? They can drive it using gas or hybrid or electric, and they get to choose. And so like that worked really well for them. And that works well for a lot of people to be able to go like, oh, I like the hybrid technology. I get a lot more miles per gallon. I get some of the benefits of the electric engine without the hamperings of distance or charging stations and things like that. And uh, there are some other considerations for why 2023's electric vehicles uh, numbers kind of went down a little bit. They didn't go down, but they didn't increase at the level that they had over the past several years. One would be inflation. Obviously, inflation since 2020 has been a major factor for people purchasing things because the cost of everything has gone up, including the vehicles. Um, I had to pay even not for my normal uh, minivan, I think I paid like $6,000 over sticker. Cause it was at the time where it was like, we needed a car. They were like, we've got cars and we've got you by the, you know what? Uh, and so I had to pay it, you know, if I wanted a van 
And then there's rising energy prices. Uh, if you haven't noticed, energy prices have also been increasing, and that makes the charging of those vehicles a little less. If you're doing the math on it, you go, ah, am I saving that much by going with an EV? Uh, also, some of the incentives that we had, those tax incentives are starting to expire, and some of the people that can afford it are just going, ah, eh, I'm not going to pick it if I'm not getting that $7,000 tax incentive essentially and then hybrids like i said are just really popular because they're the best of both worlds you get the higher miles per gallon without those trade-offs of charging stations and distance and things like that so one case study the democrats bring up a lot is norway because norway had a really high level of a of ev adoption but because the government meddled in it and encouraged people to buy evs by giving them a like $27,000 in tax breaks per vehicle compared to purchasing a large internal combustion engine vehicle. And they will actually drive large combustion engines in Nora because they've got mountains. You know, we don't necessarily all throughout America, a lot of people just buy a big SUV and then drive it to the mall and the grocery store, but they, you know, actually use them sometimes in the mountains. Um, and so $27,000 in tax breaks uh, who's not going to take that, right? But that does come at a cost to the government and to the taxpayers, right? But they didn't just do tax breaks on the vehicle purchasing itself. They also waived things like tolls if you were driving an electric vehicle. They waived parking fees in most municipalities. They allowed EVs to use bus lanes so you can get around traffic. And they ensured charging rights in apartment buildings. I guess that just means that they said, um, by law, apartment buildings have to have a certain number of chargers or something. And so that way you could move knowing that an electric charging chase station is not like, a, oh, I've got to make sure my apartment has one of those if I'm going to be able to live there. And um, they've already rolled back some of those tax incentives and the demand then decreased accordingly. So the the way they got high adoption is high um, subsidizing of it. And we can talk about whether we should or shouldn't subsidize things, I'm okay with the government subsidizing some things and some things I'm not okay with them. It really does depend on how we're subsidizing stuff. Um, that would be probably an entirely different episode, but I don't necessarily love these electric vehicle incentives because for the most part, they're going to rich people. You could look at like Joe Biden's student loan debt forgiveness stuff as an example of something where I think that he's trying to give money to a constituency. So when I say give money, that's coming from taxpayers. So anytime you, whatever, forgive student loans or give someone a tax break or give a tax incentive, that's money that doesn't go into, or actually in, in the case of a tax incentive, that's money that doesn't go into the tax system. So $7,000 tax credit means that's 7,000 less dollars that person has to pay in taxes that year. That's $7,000 fewer, rev less revenue, right? So we're giving that to rich people who are mostly buying these EVs who could afford to buy it even if they didn't get the $7,000 tax incentive. And that's why I don't like stuff like the student loan forgiveness because it's it's a carve out for his constituency, just like EV discounts are also kind of a carve out for his constituency. I think the more fair way to do it would be like, if you want to do, forget student loans, do car payments instead. If you do car loans, those are, you know, rich people have car loans, poor people have car loans, businesses have car loans. That would have been a better thing. If you're going to forgive debt, that'd be a more, I hate to use this word, equitable. I mean, because that's their whole thing, right? Is equity, is Democrats, that's their thing. So everything's got to be equity. Well, I mean, that would be more equal. You're talking about college loans being a small percentage of the population, but this is about playing to their base and their base likes electric vehicles and their base is going to buy electric vehicles. And so they give them a tax break on them. I think that's kind of gross. I don't really like that incentive structure. I'd rather find a way to incentivize people to buy electric vehicles, but do it in a way that incentivizes it across the board. Like we need more affordable electric vehicles, for example. We need fewer luxury versions of those vehicles, but the luxury ones are the ones that are selling. We can't, we cannot vilify the car companies for building the car that their consumers want, right? That's just doesn't make any sense. So, um, but because this essentially turns into Nor what happened in Norway is that rich people are going to pay for these EVs or the government. That's kind of that's how it works. Either the person's going to buy the vehicle or the government has to subsidize it. And if the government stops subsidizing, people tend to right now, at least stop buying them. So what I don't like about Biden's plan is that I think it's going to end up being that we have to subsidize this a whole lot 
for a vehicle that may not actually be more efficient, right? Because we talked about those numbers. And if the electric vehicle is not actually helping us the way we think it is, and we're giving all these taxpayer incentives for them, um, what have we solved, right? Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Also in Norway, just worth mentioning. So from two, this is a direct quote from that report. So from 2010 to 2022, Norway added 550,000 EVs, but the number of ICE vehicles on the road rather than falling also increased by 32,630 vehicles. While the population grew by 11%, the total number of passenger cars grew by 25%. When an EV household prefers to avoid a road or ferry toll, have access to free parking or charging, or avoid congestion by using bus lanes, they use their electric vehicle. When they visit their height in the mountains, they use their ICE. The impact has been so material that advocates have lobbied for a government-funded ICE scrappage program, another veiled EV subsidy. This is like cash for clunkers that Obama did, where he said, hey, if you come and per if you trade your old car in for a certain level of fuel-efficient vehicle, we will buy that vehicle from you and then crush it and destroy it so that no one can buy it again. They were trying to take the old cars off the road. What I don't like about that is that's another subsidy for rich people because guess what? Poor people buy old used cars. When I was 16, I bought a nine-year-old Toyota Corolla uh, because that's what I could afford. It was 3,500 bucks. That was the cash I had. That was the car I could afford. It was fuel efficient. It was a reliable car. It was a great car. I liked it. But the cash for clunkers program or like these sort of scrappage of internal combustion engine programs that they're proposing in places like Norway. And I'm sure will be proposed here as well. They take those cars off the road. So there are fewer affordable cars for poorer people. So I don't like that either. I think that that's has some weird economic um, problems that come along with it. So what you essentially ended up with in Norway is rich people bought the electric vehicles because of those massive subsidies and then they also kept their internal combustion engines because they had those same worries about the limitations that I listed earlier. So they didn't really solve the problem. Yes, they had a high adoption rate, but they did not decrease the number of internal combustion engines on the road. So Norway spent a ton of money. And by the way, how much money did they spend is like $4 billion annually on those subsidies, which is as much as their total highway and public in infrastructure maintenance budget. So they spent as much on the vehicles, on people purchasing the vehicles as they did on all of their highway and public infrastructure maintenance. That's a lot of freaking money. And that's a small country. We're a much bigger country and we're going to have a lot more infrastructure situations that go along with that, like increasing the power grid, adding charging stations, rural areas in America are going to be a real problem for it. So I think we're running too far ahead of ourselves without looking at the real, what's the real cost of this going to be. We're just like making a plan and then we're going to try to implement a bunch of policies to get to that goal. And I don't love that. So the press and Democrats love to praise Norway's aggressive switch to EVs for reducing carbon emissions by 16%. That's all it reduced is from like, I think it was 2010 to 2022. I might be wrong in those years, but that was the decrease in carbon emissions in Sweden from the switch to EVs. Because even though people kept their internal combustion engines if they're driving them less because they're driving the EV more, they decreased it by 16%. Well, the U.S. decreased our emissions by 32% over the same period of time. Two-thirds of that reduction was just from using natural gas instead of coal. Had nothing to do with vehicle efficiency or anything else, okay? And a third of those reductions were from switching to, like, renewables and things. So we accomplished the same reduction, or actually a better reduction in CO2 percentage. And I'm not talking about the number, the total of carbon. I'm talking about the percentage of it. So year over year, because we're a bigger country, like I said, so it wouldn't be fair to compare the numbers. You got to compare the percentages. And so, but we did that with just switching to natural gas. And so, you know, I don't understand that they really benefited the planet that much more than we did just by our switch. So, this paper argues that Norway should be a warning to the U.S. against trying to adopt EVs at 100% because the negative economic and societal consequences resulting from their low energy return on investment. And that's when it comes to, like, what's powering those cars, right? So Norway also had higher energy costs um, because of this. So Norway's transition to EVs led to a significant increase in electricity demand, obviously, because you've got to plug these cars in, Right. Much of that electricity is generated in Norway with sources with a low EROI, like hydroelectric and wind power. So even though those are sustainable 
they are not they don't have high EROI, so they cost a lot more, and that in, that then results in a higher energy cost for businesses and consumers and everyone, even the people that didn't buy EVs. Right, that's a problem too. If we make energy more costly, I know that rich people don't care about energy costs, but I assume that if you like make three hundred thousand dollars a year, you don't look at your electric bill as carefully as someone that makes fifty thousand dollars a year. Those energy increases make huge differences to the total amount of money that people are purchasing. Like, how much is someone's electricity bill based on their total income? And it's a lot higher, obviously, if you make less money, right? Because there's probably a certain floor that a house is going to use for energy consumption. So we've got to think about, like, will this make energy costs higher? And should we do it if so? There's also an environmental impact because those production and disposal of EV batteries require significant amounts of energy and raw materials. As I mentioned earlier, when you build these electric vehicles, you've got to mine those raw materials. You've got to build that battery. That can have a negative impact on the environment, not just, like I said, with carbon emissions, but just the environment of the mining environment. And like I said, in China, they're using slave labor for some of this. So we've got to consider those kind of things, right? Uh, There's also infrastructure costs, because if you're going to have widespread EV usage, you're going to have to develop the charging infrastructure for it. And we try, we're having plans for that. I, I, my prediction, I don't make a ton of predictions because I'm often wrong, but I think the estimations for the cost of building out that infrastructure is going to be much higher than they're claiming it's going to be because I think it's going to be harder. It already has been harder. They've been trying to do this for years. There's been very little adoption of those charging stations because they're so prohibitively expensive right now when the government's using them. Um, And then there's grid stability and reliability. Look, I think this is a big problem. If you haven't noticed, we've had brownouts and blackouts throughout the country because our power infrastructure is kind of crumbling a lot of this is really really old and we're not even just talking about the energy like source we're talking about the actual lines that take it from the power plant to your house these are getting old something like 70 percent of them are aging and are almost at end of life and so the ev usage is just going to put a higher strain on the electrical grid so i think we really have to fix the electrical grid before we try to like convert everyone to electric vehicles or else we're going to have way bigger problems um Because, you know, EVs are going to obviously increase the amount of electricity we use as we switch from using petroleum products like gasoline to using electricity. The electricity demand is going to go up. Uh, You might remember the headlines in California a couple years because they passed a law that said they wanted the whole state to convert to electric vehicles uh, by 2050. So they passed this law that said, we're going to convert the whole thing. And I think actually not even just that. I think it's that their whole grid is going to be renewables. And a week later, less than a week later, they had a headline where the governor was asking people to stop charging their electric vehicles during peak hours uh, because the grid couldn't keep up with it. So they're saying you have to buy an electric car. Uh, By the way, you can't charge your electric car. It was comical, right? It was like a right wing fever dream, right? It was like, it was a perfect set of headlines, like, you know, the, the thought and then the actual practical real life example of what might happen. Um, and and to be fair, like, I think our grid can get there. Uh, I looked at a consumer reports report that claimed that we can go full electric by 2050 on vehicles and we would have to increase our electricity production by 1% every year until then, and we'd be fine. But the problem with that math is that Biden wants us to adopt electric cars at a higher rate than that 1% power output per year. So if you really want to get to 40% of electric vehicle sales, of, of sales being electric in 2030, that's just six, five, six years away, you're going to have to significantly increase the power grid right now. You can't just do 1% a year. So Consumer Reports is correct, but they you can't just do it 1% every year. You're going to have to front load some of that. And that's without taking into account those old power lines and that infrastructure stuff that we've got to fix, whether we increase capacity or not, right? We've got to fix that stuff no matter what, even if everything stays the same. So it's not just about producing more electricity. I'm confident we could do that, um, especially if we stopped vilifying natural gas and nuclear energy <laughs> specifically. But that aging infrastructure is a big problem. Our substations, our power lines, all that stuff is aging. And so that's why we're having more blackouts. We had more blackouts in the last 20 years than the 20 years prior to that. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me technologically. We should be having fewer 
fewer blackouts than we did in 2000 in 2020, right? That just doesn't make any sense. Some of it's extreme weather events. Some of it's just supply and demand. Uh, some of it's just aging infrastructure. But we've got to fix that problem before we can say we can go all electric on these vehicles. And I just don't think we're paying enough attention to that grid part of it. So what is the solution then? I'm here complaining about all this stuff. I think the better solution, and I know there's this caricature of conservatives that we hate the environment or we don't believe the science, but what I'm presenting right now is data, which is science, okay? Science is data, and this data says that electric vehicles require more energy input per mile, per mile than ICEs, right? And I do think EVs could be a way to zero emissions. I like electric vehicles. Like I said, my brother has that Jeep. It's awesome. We took it out to Paladero Canyon and I took my, you know, gas guzzling Jeep. That's a 2010 Wrangler. And it was really fun to drive his out on the trail because it's totally quiet. Like the electric vehicle out in nature is really cool and fun. And I liked it. And I would buy an electric vehicle myself if it made financial sense. But we could get to zero emissions with them, but there's a really specific condition with it. It ha The grid has to be powered by something with a really high EROI. It can't be 3.5 to 1 like solar and wind is. I understand that the technology is going to improve with solar and wind. I get that. I'm not saying it's statically going to be 3.5 to 1 EROI for the next 30 years. But we have energy sources right now, like nuclear, that have 100 to 1 EROI. Why would we not go all in on using natural gas, nuclear? And it's going to be a mix. It's never, I'm not saying we get rid of solar and we get rid of wind. I'm saying we need all of these things. I think Democrats are insane to think that we can power our entire electric grid by solar and wind alone. It's not possible. And hydro, I guess we'll include that in there. Um, it's weird to me that Democrats don't mention nuclear. You know, the, we had the Green New Deal by AOC and the kind of progressive side of the, of the Democratic Party. And nowhere in that proposal did it mention nuclear energy. I'm sorry, I do not take you seriously. And I do not take your warnings that climate change is this existential threat if you won't consider using nuclear energy to power the grid and those electric vehicles. Um, I'm for zero emissions eventually in America. I think that we can do that because we're rich enough to do it, but we shouldn't force the rest of the world to be expected to develop their countries and their economies, you know, these upcoming, these up and coming economies. We shouldn't expect them to do the same things as, as we are right now when we are fully developed in a first world country. We're expecting, okay, well, we used coal and steam and all this kind of stuff to get where we are, but we don't want other people to. I think it's gross and economically wrong to keep people poor so that they have cleaner energy. I get the thought process there. If you think that climate change is going to be an existential threat to the planet and to human beings on it, you'd go, it's worth economic problems to save your life, but they can't prove that there's going to be a catastrophe at the end of this. I think that the data shows there's not a catastrophe. Um, I've seen the, I, I wish I had the numbers of this right now, but someone did the math on if you imposed all of these economic kind of crushing things, like trying to make a third world country only use renewable energy, source, energy sources instead of coal, the economic impact of that is way worse and worse for poverty, which is worse for life expectancy and worse for mortality and all these kind of things. Um, then the worst case scenarios of two degrees of Celsius rise in temperature by 2100. It's not worth the trade-off to me. I'd rather humans flourish. And I'm not saying the world, I just don't think the world's going to end. Yes, I think we're going to have some problems with climate change. I think that most of them can be mitigated with technology, though, which we see improve all the time. Natural gas is a great example. The, the way we learn to frack and get that stuff out of the ground with horizontal wells drastically decreased the cost of getting it out of the ground, which made it have a really high EROI, which made it a really good source because it burns a lot cleaner than coal does. And so we reduced our emissions in the United States mostly by switching to natural gas. And that's the kind of technological change that I think is going to make this stuff work. So I'm fine with electric vehicles, fine with it. But I'm not okay with pretending that electric vehicles solve the problem if you don't combine it with something like nuclear energy. That's that's all I'm saying. And and that's really what we have to we have to we've got to look at. And so to me, 
the only fuel source that can achieve that right now is nuclear energy. So I would like to see more talk about nuclear energy. And we have seen more of it over the last few years. You've seen some people come around to it, even on the left. And But it is still off the table for a lot of Democrats. I mentioned the AOC Green New Deal. It didn't mention it at all. To me, that proves they're the ones who are unserious about climate change, not people on the right. Because if this is really the sort of existential threat that they say it is, why wouldn't we throw everything we have at nuclear energy? It's safe. It's safer than all the other energy sources as far as like actually getting it produced. Um, I think since the dawn of nuclear, there's been fewer than 200 deaths from the accidents and the building of the uh, nuclear facilities and stuff. So that would be like 200 people since whatever, 1950 something. Uh, versus 8 billion people. This seems like a really easy trade-off, even if you count for the accidents, although I think we can prevent the accidents. The most recent one, Fukushima, totally preventable. There there was a proposal, I think it was a $2 million change in the wall, the retaining wall, because they did the math and they were like, look, you will get a tidal wave that is bigger than this wall. It's kind of like Katrina, where it was like those things were not built to withstand a Category 5 hurricane, even though we knew eventually New Orleans would get a Category 5 hurricane. It was like a $2 million thing. That ended up being like $400 billion worth of economic damage that the Fukushima power plant uh, meltdown caused. They could have spent a couple million dollars on building that seawall higher. I, it's not really a seawall. It's like a retaining wall for tsunamis specifically. And everything would be fine. Chernobyl's the same thing. It's this is These were cases in not not managing it well. They were preventable disasters, right? We can prevent these kind of things from happening. And so to me, nuclear is the thing we've got to use. Um, um, I, I don't think, like I said, climate change is this human extinction level event that the left claims it is. But my point is that if they think it is, why would we not go all in on everything that could potentially mitigate that, right? Um, I, of course, I don't think it'll come to that. So where is that in Biden's moonshot to save the planet? He just, I don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think we talk enough about, I don't think we give natural gas enough credit. You will not hear Biden go out there and say that like, hey, look, we reduced our emissions significantly by switching to natural gas. That's a good thing. Instead, he vilifies natural gas and his administration wants to do things like ban gas stoves in places like New York and California are already doing that in certain cities. They're saying you cannot get a gas stove, even for restaurants and stuff. I think that's crazy. I mean, you know, I hate the gas stove banning kind of thing. Um, if you've paid any attention to me, it's one of my bugaboos. But, um, you know, I think most people just believe them. I, I think the people peddling it probably believe that they're doing actual good. I don't like to assume ill intent like they do for us all the time. I feel like the left often comes and says, you know, the right doesn't care about the planet, as if half this country just doesn't care about the planet we live on. If we really believed, as if we really believe that the world's going to end, but we just don't care. I don't think that's it. First of all, we don't believe, I mean, I don't believe that the world's going to end based on climate change. I've not seen the data. Even the IPCC doesn't believe that. That's a thing that the media and politicians have ran with because they get to, keep in mind, let's go back to how this works. The government gives discounts to rich people to buy electric vehicles. Uh, the people that run those electric vehicle companies, for the most part, are kind of elitish too. Uh, so they're making money. They're happy about it. Um, the, all these people buying, for the most part, not all of them, but a lot of the people buying electric vehicles and the people benefiting from the sales of those electric vehicles based on taxpayer incentives are, are in the Democratic base. So this is buying votes is what it really boils down to, I think. Now, I'm not saying that's their intention. I shouldn't assume that's their intention, but it certainly is a, it's a perk. They get a claim they're saving the world. That's what their constituency wants. They get to, you know, pat themselves on the back because they bought an electric vehicle and therefore they're superior to you. Um, but I, I just don't think we're talking enough about the data. And I think if we knew more about, like I said, I don't think that if you purchase an electric vehicle, you're actually doing much more for the environment right now than if you purchased an internal combustion engine because of all that work that goes into creating the battery and the power sources that go into it. And I, you know, we're just not there yet. And I know we could be there in the future, I'm not saying we won't be, but right now it seems like a racket. And like I said, those green sectors get rich. Uh, you get a $7,000 credit for your new car that you didn't really need that $7,000 credit. Cause you're buying a Rivian or $130,000 Tesla X. Um, 
you know, I just don't think we should have these subsidies right now unless they are more across the board, across classes. Seems more fair to me. Uh, Ford is selling electric cars at a discount to rich people who can afford the price tag. And then we get to foot the bill as the U.S. taxpayers, even whether we want an electric vehicle or not. And that is currently how the electric car market works, okay? I don't, and we've seen that as those subsidies go away, people are buying fewer electric vehicles. I, I just think that this is a bad way to do it. And so how do we fix that? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's fair to assume that either side has bad intentions. I don't think the Democrats... I think they really think they're trying to save the planet. And I think people on the right think that, no, this math doesn't add up. I think that they're, the assuming of ill intent on both sides is wrong on this ish issue for sure. Like I said, I do think the Democrats are absolutely politically motivated to do some of this stuff because it is what their voters want. Climate change and environmentalism has kind of become a religion on the left. It's kind of replaced religion. Think about it. It's kind of religion. You know, the world's going to end if we don't do something. Um, you, you look at like it's the badge of honor. It's like the EV or riding the bike or whatever the situation is. There's like all these sort of things that go along with it. It's like a religion now. And that's kind of weird. I think Biden and Democrats should be more honest about what's going on and what it's going to take to get to zero emissions. Whether that's moving to more natural gas, whether that's moving to more nuclear, whether that's admitting that solar and wind and hydroelectric cannot power the United States exclusively, it cannot do it. We cannot do it with renewables exclusively. Our power grid needs a lot of work to be able to do any of this stuff. If we want to get to 40% of the sales, we're going to have to do a lot of work to the grid in the next six years. And um, I think we've got to talk more about nuclear. I think both sides need to talk more about nuclear. We got to get rid of some of the new, the red tape that it takes to put a nuclear facility online. It's pretty silly to me that Germany had something like 75% of their power supplied by nuclear. And after the Fukushima thing, they just said, we're going to get rid of our nuclear. Their energy costs have soared. They're like four times higher than what it was a couple years ago. And honestly, without like us being able to export liquefied natural gas to Europe uh, because of the Russia sanctions and what's going on in Ukraine, there'd be people freezing to death in Europe. They're lucky they didn't have the freeze they had the last year, um, or it could have been worse. And so I think it's foolish to, to get rid of power sources before the new ones have the technology to, and the, like the efficiency to replace them. I just, I think that's foolish. And I think it's foolish to try to like pin these electric vehicle sales at a certain percentage and hold vehicle manufacturers to those numbers if the consumers don't want those vehicles. They want hybrids right now. Why don't we take that as a win? Like I said, if you've got a 40 mile per hour for a 40 mile per gallon vehicle versus a 20 mile per, per gallon vehicle, most consumers are going to go, I'll take the 41, all things equal, because that's going to save me half the gas money I have to spend. So I think we should look more at at hybrids right now. I think that that's going to be the future for the next several years. I think that we'll get more and more efficiency and maybe we circle back to this in 10 years or something. I, I think that we are jumping way too far ahead in this. I think the Biden administration knew that that's why they dialed back their original stuff. I think originally they wanted it to be 50% of vehicle sales in 2030 would be electric. And they pulled that back to 33 to 41%. So they already dialed it back some, I think they need to dial it back even more because I think consumers are just not there yet. And the president and the technocrats and Congress, as much as they've ever tried to control the economy and look, the right is bad about this too. Now, both sides are trying to pretend that like, well, if we just had the right people in there pulling the right strings, we can make this whole thing work. That's not how this economy works. The economy is complicated and the best way to let it work is let consumers tell you how it should work. So if consumers start demanding electric vehicles, guess what? The car companies are going to start creating electric vehicles for them to buy. That's how it's going to work. Yes, we can do some incentives, but so far the incentives have only really benefited rich people, and I don't like that necessarily. I think that if you're going to have incentives for a change, it should try to be across the board. Obviously, any, two, any new technology is going to be adopted by rich people first. In the 1950s or whenever it was, only rich people had microwaves. Now everyone has microwaves or refrigerators or electricity for that matter. I mean, I think in the early, by, I think in like 1930, still, you know, 60% of the country in rural areas didn't have electricity or something. So it's always going to be an adoption of urban and richer people adopting new technologies first. 
that's okay. I just don't like incentivizing the rich people to buy the stuff first. Um, to me, that part doesn't need to happen when they've got the money anyway. So I don't love this plan. I, I wish we had some more details. I wish we had some more thought into nuclear, but I'm not the president. Uh, and Biden is. So he gets to make these kind of calls. Uh, I, I think we got to talk more about it. And we got to talk more about these kind of things. Like, are electric vehicles actually worth, is the juice worth the squeeze? And I'm not sure that they are yet. They might be in the future. They're not quite there yet. They're very cool. I like them. I just don't. And if you want to buy one, that's totally fine. I have no problem with electric vehicles. I like them a lot. But I don't think we should be subsidizing. I don't think we should try to hit these specific goals in specific time frames. So that's it for me. Thanks for joining me on today's episode of The Homeless Conservative. Your time's valuable, like I said, and I'm grateful you chose to spend some of it here. If you liked what you heard, please consider rating the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or share it with a friend. That's really the thing that helps me a ton. This conversation does not have to be one-sided either. I am keen to hear from you. So feel free to reach out on Instagram and YouTube at The Homeless Conservative or send me an email at blake at thehomelessconservative.com. Your input really does mean a lot. I'll talk to you next time.